The Carver Project is a unique artistic exhibit that features a collection of many written responses by Vancouver's downtown Eastside community. Every year we ask the community a thought-provoking question with the goal of sharing the humanity behind the community. In this slide, you'll see some of the responses from the questions that we've asked in our previous years in Carver Project 1 and 2. And this year, our question was, what have you learned about community and connection in the past year? And our heart goes out to our community partners, Union Gospel Mission, Mission Possible, and Eastside Works, who helped us gather these responses. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, you're so kind. Hi, my name is Carissa Lindicho, and I will be your host for this evening for Carver Project 3.0. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am the current head of advocacy as well as a community mentor for Employed to Empower. I am beyond thrilled for you to meet and hear these amazing stories from each of our speakers today. Um, Hannah Ahn and Shafia Ali are licensed practical nurses at the Crosstown Advocacy oh, Health for Hannah. Both have found a love for practice in areas of mental health and substance use. Shafia and Hannah specialize in providing resources for safe consumption as part of addiction, mental health, and drug replacement services. They provide harm reduction supplies and assist in medical intervention for overdoses. Both have encountered the stigma drug users face in healthcare. From a trauma-informed lens based in compassion and genuine care, these nurses hope to educate attendees on their experiences working in the community and how we can all contribute and be better equipped. Better. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Beautiful. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for, I can only imagine how busy your days are on a daily. And so it means so much to me and the audience members that you're here. Um, I guess first off, um, I would love to tap into, you know, well, of course, being nurses, you probably had never anticipated something like a pandemic to occur. That, that is no way in your, your training or ed education. <laughs> um, looking back over the past year, what are some of the things that you, you learned, um, especially working with the downtown Eastside community? Yeah. I mean, we learned so many things, but one thing that I know was mentioned in session one and two, again, stigma. Um, I know it's everywhere and it's also in healthcare settings. And it's so unfortunate to see that. I think a lot of people see downtown inside clients as somebody who have addiction issues, who have substance use disorder, but we don't think about substance use disorder is actually a mental health disorder. And that substance use over time, maybe they use because of trauma and pain or mistreatment too. Um, it can get you to withdraw symptoms, which is why they use drugs again to avoid those negative feelings like irritability, um, anxiety, and depression. Um, and I got to work with these individuals and I have to say they are very authentic, genuine, real people. And whenever I build that rapport with them and I get to talk with them in a safe space, we get to connect and talk about our trauma and our pain. And I feel like I'm getting healed by them. So I really feel like that stigma needs to slowly go away. <laughs> Yeah, and um, uh, resources. Um, I already know that there's limited resources out there, um, but I got to see how limited resources became after COVID hit. Um, we had to not only protect the clients or the residents, we also had to protect staff members, which meant decreasing bed capacities at detox centers, at shelters, um, which then limited um, hygiene on inability to go to, uh, you know, washrooms, showers, laundry, such things like that. Um, and then also uh, grief uh, counseling for people that did lose um, individuals to overdose. Um, or COVID, you know, either or, um, just seeing how limited resources are and how much we, how much more we need. Um, we got to see a lot of that. Yes. Um, and even for our public, I think there is lack of awareness about mental health. I know it's 
much better now. But still, I find that we have not enough resources about mental health, substance use, alcohol use, and mental health in general. And us, you know, with COVID, we also suffered and we needed counseling. And counseling was also a limited option for us. Yeah. And same with healthcare workers. And we can talk about yeah, that. Um, healthcare workers are constantly burning out um, much more in the past year. And they're limited to counseling as well because there's wait lists so it prolongs their return back to work um and you know it just shows again how much we need counseling resources and um how much how much more information and education is needed on these topics um to increase um people to feel positive towards self-care um, and not have a negative um, effect about it yeah and lastly we also learned that the overdose crisis in downtown east side is so surreal. I didn't know this um, before I worked in downtown east side and it's already been a 50 year pandemic and it's a medical emergency. Um, it's about 17, 16 deaths in 2020 in BC alone. That is 33 to 34 people in thousand people um, due to unnatural cause as well. And that's five people every day and it's all preventable debts. And some of those debts are our clients and who we got to know individual, um, not you know because of their substance use, but because of their human being. Um, I just find that we need to stop that now. Yeah, we need to raise more awareness. Thank you for, for sharing. And, and I, in the most genuine way to thank you because again, as I had mentioned in the beginning, um, this is the opportunity to hear the stories of those individuals who have lived it. And because, you know, there's only so much that I can say to speak on behalf of your experiences. It's it's you two that can really. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yes, you too. <laughs> the cheers were good. <laughs> but. Yes, to to bring it back to um, what you were what you were saying, it, it's it's valuable to hear these experiences um, because that mm -hmm. is where where change starts. That's where pro uh, progress starts, um, and where you know it's important to have voices such as yourselves to be available and to be amplified. Um, that's kind of what brings me to my next question of you know from your experiences and from what you learned and witnessed and lived through, what what needs to be done that either hasn't been done already that, or maybe that could be added, that could maybe be improved. Um, yeah. Um, so like I just mentioned, increasing resources, um, resources um, like housing, harm reduction. So harm reduction is, um, you know, giving people safe supply um, of uh, needles and instead of sharing needles, um, which can prevent um, things from happening, um, opening more opportunities for people to have like modular housing. Um, and uh, the biggest thing is increasing peer support. Um, I think having peer support and out outreach or in clinics, wherever, um, is so essential because they really can help an individual who's maybe in crisis mode really understand, hey, you know, things are going to be tough right now, but they are going to get better. And they can talk about their lived experiences and, and you know, calm um, an individual down. Yeah, 100%. Every time I go to work and I see peer workers, I feel like there's extra energy, there's extra colors to the work site. And I feel like, you know, whenever I have personal issues, I would go talk to them and I feel so validated and so heard and they give the best advices that I couldn't even ask from my counselors because they have the lived experience. And I think that will really enrich our system. Um, second thing, going back to our public, um, I feel like there should be more resources to us. I feel like there should be more of trauma-informed practice. I don't think only nurses, um, doctors, or paramedics, or firefighters should be the only one learning about trauma-informed practice. I think that's something that 
needs to be taught even in school. So what we were thinking is like soon, I would love to see nurses, peer support workers in high school, maybe grade 10, and doing not only one day drop it, but like entire curriculum about health promotion related to alcohol use, substance use, um, trauma-informed practice, mental health, self safe care, um, all those things would be really, really necessary. And healthcare workers. Yeah, and for healthcare workers, um, educating around substance use disorder. Because um, a lot, when I used to work in acute care, um, I had to inform myself. Um, not a lot of people knew about um, trauma informed uh, practice around uh, substance use and mental health. So, um, education around that, um, having more um, nurses out there doing outreach, um, introducing more LPN liaisons because LPNs are doing more practical work in regards to. Um, substance use um, and mental health and you know we are able to do more of the detailed assessments. Yeah um, if I had that LPN mentor I would have been I think more confident and deliver that quality of care. Um, ever since I joined downtown Eastside and addiction services I think the past year I worked in so many um, clinics just so that I can get all this information and education but I think if we had that extra LPN nurses, since LPNs are so needed in community, that would be so essential. And the last thing I think I wanna really bring to the attention is the decriminalizing the drug use. For decades, we criminalize people who possess and use drug, but I think it's not working. And it's time for us to use that right resources and support those who are vulnerable to help them. Um, and when we start doing that, then the conversation around this will become more normalized and then people will come for more, come for help. And then we can provide that early interventions and reverse that hopefully the substance use disorder and the mental health piece. Sorry, I'm just taking that all in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I, I don't know why, but I held my breath the whole time. I was just like, oh my God. I was like, I, for some reason, I thought breathing would just interrupt the flow. So I was like, mm. <laughs> Am I but, talking too fast? <laughs> no, 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 no. It was just, it was everything you shared is just so, so important. Is so, uh, and again, is, is something that I personally have never had access to in terms of knowledge because I've never lived it. I've never experienced it. And so to hear firsthand, you know, obviously the things that we see positively in our healthcare system and that works, but you know, all the things that, you know, could be improved, not only looking at from patient care and understanding it's not just physical, it's not just biological. There's so many different elements. There's so many different layers to a human being, not only in terms of the person receiving care, but the person distributing care. And also outside of that, the the people that will train and inspire the next generations of people receiving and treating care. Um, so I'm just honestly taking that all in. <laughs> That's where my mind's going. <laughs> um, and so on that topic of you know, being presented with somebody that has a lived experience and me personally being someone that's not in the healthcare system that I probably won't be working in the healthcare system or neither in the policy making realm. Um, what, and same for many people in the audience, what are, what are some things that, that you think we could do, whether that be right now, tomorrow, next week? Um, something so basic like showing kindness and compassion, um, whether it be someone in the downtown Eastside community or just in the public, um, you know, just showing that you just, you know, with a smile, I know it's hard with masks, but, you know, not being mean, but if it's somebody that you're working with, or if you're in the downtown Eastside community, if somebody says hi, just returning that hi back, um, saying, hey, how are you, um, goes a long way, especially if somebody's having a bad day, because you always got to think back to yourself when you're having a bad day. If somebody approaches you negatively, that just makes your day even worse. So, you know, if you have a moment to express some kindness and compassion, through some words, why not? You know, it, it, it wouldn't hurt. Yeah, and simply just thinking instead of what is wrong with you, thinking what happened to you? What pain or trauma have you gone through that put you to this position now? 
um, but also really, really basic but important is self-care. I think we often forget our own mental health and just checking in with yourself and also start educating yourself around, you know, what really trauma-informed practice is and trying to unwarn that um, previous st stigmas that we have learned so, for so long. Yeah. And the more we start using these resources, the more people are going to realize that we need an increase of these resources um, and the importance of it. Um, and especially for everybody, once we start using these resources, we will start to feel more more healed. We'll feel more, you know, accepted, and, and the stigmas will start to reduce as well. And also, we wanted to show you guys uh, Narcan training. As we have mentioned already that, you know, overdose crisis is real. As humans, we all can help with doing Narcanning. So let's just say somebody overdosed and need Narcan, because that's going to save their life. Um, we are going to quickly demonstrate that. And I think to policymakers out there, what if you have a commercial? You know, we had a commercial about EpiPen for somebody who was having an allergic reaction. What about for NICAT? This is a medical emergency. So, so here we have NICAT kit. And let's just say somebody collapsed and is not breathing, not responding to your voice, nor responding to your pain. Then we'll First, Prepare. you want to call 911 um, because while you start doing this, you want to make sure that somebody is on route because it might not happen right away. It might take a few minutes. Um, and then, so this is the Narcan kit. You can get it from any pharmacy for free. And it has the three syringes and three ampules. And each ampule is a Narcan of 0.4 milligrams. And you just do this to get rid of the bubble that's at the at the top, and then you break it. All right, and then they come with three syringes because you might have to do this three times. Um, so you just want to take the syringe out, put it straight into the ampule, and then inject everything out. Then, and this is going to be very nerve wracking. Yes, but it's okay. It takes practice. Then once you have it, you just give it to someone. <laughs> we forgot an orange to inject it. <laughs> um, you want to make sure it's a muscle. So, you know, on the side of the legs, on the side of the arms, wherever you feel that kind of meaty, hard muscle, you just want to inject 90 degrees into the muscle. Um, the trick here is you want to inject all the way through and you want to make sure you inject inject you want to feel that little plunger plunge down because that shows that the, the the needle is no longer there it's plunged back in so it's you know safer um no chance of pricking somebody else with the needle yeah and then let's just say you gave the first dose the client did not come back you prepared the second dose and they came back there you go um they're gonna feel very sick because they normally describe it as a dope sick um, because we just reverse them from their high. Um, you just kind of remind them, hey, you overdosed, you weren't responding. So we had to give the Narcan. You were out for 20 minutes, the paramedics on the way, you're okay. And you want to keep your distance because there is a chance they will be flailing their arms just because they're shocked suddenly and you know you brought them back to life. So they will they won't know what's happening. So don't take that offensively. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I get more and more information. I, I knew that, so to the audience, I knew that this was coming, but I, I, just, like, I, I didn't want, like, sh they didn't show me what, what it was, the whole thing that was going to go down. And so I, I am just as excited, but also nervous, but also, you know, just not confident, but more so, I will be confident in a moment, um, but more so <laughs> honored, not honored appreciative of the knowledge that you have you have shared um, because it is important knowledge is important knowledge to have even if you think that you might not use it or 
Now you might be afraid to use it. It's important to just have. And so thank you so much for, for yeah. sharing with us. Um, for our last, I believe we have a few more minutes. Last question I would love to, to ask you is kind of a nice like take home message. There's many things that were shared, many good things. I hope everyone caught it. Um, I know that my brain was trying to process everything. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, what, from you, what is something that needs to be heard? What is something that needs to be said to the audience members that might be from very diverse backgrounds, diverse careers and, you know, places in life? What is, what would you like them to know? Um, understanding that we're all humans um, and we all, um, you know, have bad days, have good days, um, you know, making sure, like I said before, just asking, how are you? Um, if it's somebody that works in, in the community, um, in the clinics, asking their clients, um, once you have good trust, um, what is the trauma that led you towards this journey? Um, because there's a journey, nobody, um, you know, uh, goes through a hard time because they want to, something happens that leads them towards this. Um, so just really asking that makes a lot of, um, someone feel a lot better. And also understanding that the people that are substance users, they're trying to chase their initial first high. Um, you'll never get, get that high ever again. But that's what you're chasing and then that's where the addiction starts and then the withdrawal and there's a whole cycle related to this so just really understanding that there's more than the eye can see yeah and also we have to know that prescription drugs in the past like the oxycodones and such also led people to where they are now um so we a society made a genuine mistake now how can we do together to help those people who are left behind and like we said, by punishing them, making feel ashamed and guilty is not the way. The way to go about this is showing that genuine compassion and that we are all here together and this is all our duty. Um, we lost, again, some people over this last couple years and I think it's time to just really stop and do better as a society. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I got chills. <laughs> I got, um, but thank you from the bottom of my heart, not only joining us today um, in this dialogue, but thank you for, for what you do every, every day. Um, I know that it's appreciated by many. Um, and if someone hasn't told you, I'm proud of you. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> I don't know why I was like, I, this is what I want to say. <laughs> oh, well, that was so so wonderful um again I, I keep saying thank you but just thank you <laughs> um to the audience if you have any questions for hannah and shafia please um i, I turned into a youtuber at one point i was like drop it in the drop the link in the no but comment in the <laughs> comment in the chat uh, and we'll hopefully be able to cover all the questions in the q a that will be at the end of the session but until then we're going to have a quick break up next after the break is Austin Louie, the community developer at Embers Eastside Works, uh, another essential worker who works closely with the downtown Eastside and kind of bringing in the perspective from a grassroots organization. But until then, sit tight, maybe grab a drink of water, get some snacks, and we'll see you soon. Austin Louie is an independent consultant who specializes in strategic planning, public engagement, training, and working with populations facing barriers. He is currently the Programming and Partnership Director at Embers Eastside Works, a low-barrier employment hub in the downtown eastside of Vancouver. With his Master's in Community and Regional Planning at UBC, Austin's interests include community and economic development, social innovation, and working with folks facing barriers. He will speak to the frontline realities of the pandemic and grassroots organizations and the need for representation to invoke systemic change. <laughs> okay, you're good to go. All right, amazing. Well, welcome back to Carver Project 3.0. Today, for our second speaker of the day, we have Austin Louis. <laughs> well, can we get a big round of applause for Austin, please? Thank you. Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, I don't know what that feedback was, but nice. <laughs> uh, Austin, hello. So, hello. Real, hello. 
real <laughs> quick, before we dive into some of the questions I have prepared for you today, uh, could you just also give us a rundown of kind of what you do at uh, Embers and Eastside Works uh, as a community developer? Sure. Um, so Eastside Works, we are a low barrier employment center in the downtown east side. Um, also, we do a lot of social innovation work, which um, how I define that is we really kind of think about the systems that we're in right now and really trying to move the dial on um, making sure that the systems aren't forgetting the people that are have the most barriers to accessing. Uh, so, you know, we work quite closely with with Work BC, but we're separate from from Work BC. And, um, and, and Eastside Works was kind of came out of a need for the community for more low barrier employment supports. Um, and so, we've been open since April of 2018, and I've been a part of the development of that since before we we opened up. Um, and so, what I do as a community developer. Um, we kind of, we have a pretty small staff team and so we kind of do everything in the center. So we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, client work, but I focus more on uh, developing partnerships and programs uh, within, within the space. Amazing. For, for context, uh, I recently, well, not recently, it's been over a year. I met Austin a year ago, um, which was always a pleasure because he is, he is very humble and a very passionate and dedicated man. And so. This makes me so excited to speak here today. <laughs> um, but to kind of dive into the work that Eastside Works has done and person that you have done, but specifically looking at the pandemic and of course that has brought on some challenges. I kind of wanted to shed some light on what those challenges might've looked like uh, for, for yourself and for the organization. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, right off the bat, I, I remember when the pandemic hit, um, the first thing that I thought of when you um, kind of pitched that question was the fact that we just didn't have any information. And there was a lot of different reactions in the downtown east side, both from agencies and from community members and from frontline workers. Um, and we just didn't know. Uh, and so everyone was, was kind of freaking out. And I think that kind of resulted in a lot of agencies, you know, shutting down and kind of doing things um, that in hindsight, we might have wanted to do differently. Um, but I also think that, you know, the, there, there were the challenges, but when I think about the pandemic, I actually always like to highlight the, the resiliency that we did see in the community. I think for the first time in, in, in ever since I've been working down there, we've, we've, we finally started to recognize the importance of peers in the community and just like the last speakers were talking about um, you know there, there was a lot of mobilization efforts that happened to mobilize peers in the community and Eastside Works was, was part of that because we were able to get funding from the ministry to actually su uh, support and pay peer workers to actually do you know outreach work work with a lot of the grassroots organizations that did not have you know charitable status and so they weren't able to access the same amount of funding um, but they were the ones that were putting boots on the ground because, you know, as frontline agencies, we didn't want to come into the community to spread um, COVID. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of peers who either, you know, were already in the community, uh, were already kind of um, inter interfacing with a lot of the, the community members because that's where they live. Um, and really, you know, trusting them and mobilizing them to support the folks and in, in, in the community was 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 awe-inspiring. Uh, it, it was it was amazing to see that, and I think it's it's often forgotten. We always see and talk about the negatives of of the downtown east side, but I think it's really really important to highlight the fact that so much mobilizing happened uh, with the peers in the downtown east side, and they were the ones who, you know, probably kept a lot more people alive than than would have been otherwise. It warms my heart so much. <laughs> oh, and it's it's true. And I can I can also vouch for that too. Working here at Employed Empower, Austin and I have seen a lot of that resiliency and seen a lot of good despite the circumstances, despite the pandemic, all that has come out of it um, because resources were pulled, because there is this increase in need. Um, and who better better to support but peers themselves and peers speaking up and you know, the grassroots organizations who have been there from the beginning, pre-COVID and during COVID that, you know, know what is, that is needed in the community and can provide that. 
Another, yeah, another thing that, you know, one was recognized too, was that a lot of the, I would say like the more institutional or larger the agency or organization was, the more risk averse they were to supporting the community. And so we had to lean on a lot of the more grassroots organizations that were able to adapt and move things on the fly uh, versus these large institutions. There was so much red tape um, that they weren't able to really mobilize in a way that um, both the community members and the peers were able to, but also the, the grassroots agencies that were, you know, putting the boots on the ground and, and doing the work. So on that topic and kind of reflecting on it's it's been over a year, um, unfortunately, of <laughs> this pandemic, uh, but I, I know you and I have talked multiple times about, you know, the need for for services and the need for support in the downtown east side that's a pre pre covid thing and that's a during covid thing and it's it's a post covid thing um so from your from your lens and from your experience what what do you think is is needed and whether that be improved or something new or maybe something different what what do you think that is um, well, kind of going back to the, the last the last topic around um, kind of like organizing and mobilizing it as, as a community, I feel like that's what we need. We need more of is kind of working together as agencies, which I, I feel like is is lacking right now. I think there, there actually is a lot of supports in the downtown east side as far as, you know, uh, people surviving and obviously that's it's not supporting everyone. Uh, and there are a lot of low barrier supports that are out there. Uh, but I think what is lacking is that connection piece, you know, um, making sure that people get to that referral that they need to get to, um, you know, making sure that people have that mental health support when they're, you know, looking for work. And uh, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a you know, humans are complicated and complex. Uh, and that's not just people in the downtown east side, but everyone. Um, and I think that we are so focused on this kind of like capitalist way of looking at things uh, where we, you know, just silo everything into mental health supports and health supports and employment supports and housing supports. Uh, but we're not actually talking, we're not really working together. Um, I especially see that working in, in the employment uh, field. I feel like we're uh, kind of often forgotten as an important part and social determinant of, of health. Um, I, you know, I, I find that there's a lot of supports when it comes to health supports, there's, there's a lot of coordination that happens, but, but anything outside of that, I feel like is, is quite, um, quite lacking. Uh, and so, you know, what I really like to do when I'm working with clients is making sure that I am connecting to um, their, their other supports, obviously with their consent, um, to make sure that, you know, they're, we are coordinating as care providers to making sure that they're, they're thriving as, as community members and not just surviving, but really actually thriving as, as, as human beings. And I think that we've also focused a lot on kind of that surviving piece, which I think is definitely important. We do need more harm reduction approaches. We need more safe supply. We need all of those things. Um, but I think that we often forget about, you know, we're, we're, we're still just fixing that bandaid uh, and we need to think beyond that. And I think, you know, employment is one aspect of that. And I've seen it firsthand so many people come into our center looking for that change in their life, looking to give back to the community, but they often just don't have the, you know, the, the resources to support them to do that. Because uh, especially employment support is, is very, you know, the, the way that we see employment is, is very, um, you know, we, we see it as full time work and, that, and that's it. But a lot of people that work in the downtown east side and live in the downtown east side um, and, you know, look at the labor force in general, too. We're all recognizing that that 40 hour uh, work week isn't sustainable, not just for community members in the downtown east side, but for everyone. Um, and so we need to kind of rethink what employment looks like and what employment means. Um, yeah, and, and then also, you know, when, when we're supporting people with employment, that also means supporting them with everything outside of employment as well, and making sure that we're connecting to those other supports. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we need more as, you know, people, workers in the front, uh, on the front lines, we need to connect with each other more and work together. And because of the fact that we're too strapped uh, for for resources, we're we're fighting each other for for funding. Uh, you know, we're we're holding on to our clients. One second, Austin. I think you. Oh, hello. I think you froze. Hello. Hello. Okay. 
One, one second. You're on such a good, a good, a good roll. Okay, so oh, no. bring it back. You were saying how um, you know, we're all strapped for resources. So instead of connecting, we're actually competing with one another. And then you cut out. So totally. I'll bring it back to you. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was pretty much the point. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's exactly it. Like we're we're not working together, and it's not um, necessarily because you know we we don't mean to be competitive, but that's just kind of the the world that we live in. We we kind of have to be. Uh, when we're so focused on, you know, reporting these numbers to funders around outcomes, around you know, how much how much we're uh, affecting the community only through numbers, but we're not actually seeing that qualitative, you know, care and seeing people as humans. Um, so we're so focused on the numbers around like how many people we've gotten to jobs, how many people we're hiring, how many people we're supporting in this way that the funders are telling us to report. Um, but we're not actually supporting people where they actually want to be supported. Um, so I think we really need to rethink, you know, how, how we're reporting these numbers, what kind of data we're actually getting when we're doing research, how we're engaging the community when we are collecting data. Um, yeah. No, I, 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 I really appreciate that you touched on that because that is, you know, when, when, when we think about, yeah, when we think about change needed, when we think about progress needed, it's important to think about the roots of things. And of course, like we've mentioned before, there are a, amazing services that are available. And when I think about it, all these services are, you know, they are um, providing um, and benefiting the same community, different for, for different needs. And so we, we are coming together with the same intent, but yet, we, like you said, we're, we're forced to be put up against one another um, for, I would love for you to kind of um, describe some of the like what what you think that is like. Is it the lack of what kind of lack of research? Is it lack of funding? Is it lack of um, people on the grounds in terms of working? Is it lack of just time, mental capacity, mm -hmm. um, or is it all of it? <laughs> yeah, def definitely all of it. Um, I, I definitely you know, can see firsthand also just like physical space. I think that there's a lot of space that's also underutilized. There's a lot of boarded up shops and spaces in the downtown east side, but then there's so many organizations and community members that need just space to operate. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, and we're so, and we're so siloed that we forget to work with one another um, to, to, to collaborate and then maybe even share spaces or, um, you know, and we we're so obsessed with the numbers that oftentimes we develop all this programming that's already being done in another agency, um, but we develop programming in order to get funding in order to operate our, our space, even though the programs that we are doing is already being done by another agency, but then we're getting clients for our programs and then we're reducing their numbers and then they don't get funded uh, for, for their programs. And so we're just competing and we don't mean to compete against one another, but that's just a system that we're, that we're in right now. Hmm. Okay. Um, and another thing to say to that too, I also, I also feel like there, we, we are starting to collaborate kind of on, on a higher level. And so, you know, ministries are, are just starting to potentially, you know, talk to one another, um, and we are recognizing the need for more collaboration. Um, but I find that those conversations are op often happening on a senior level. Um, and that, that takes years to develop sometimes. It takes years to develop that relationship. It takes years to develop these larger systemic programs that, that are more collaborative, which are great. Um, but I also think that we need to start collaborating as frontline workers, you know, as people that are supporting clients on the grounds, um, making sure that we are connecting to those other agencies. And, and, and I, I actually think that we do have the time to do that, but we really need to rethink that. As I, yeah, and I, I'm definitely at, at fault for this. Um, you know, we, we try to help, we, you know, we're, we're so compassionate. We try to help so much and we try to help in ways that we actually don't know how to help them in the best way, you know? And so like, I've definitely been at fault where I, you know, try to help someone with, you know, housing support, but then I don't know anything about the housing system. And there's another agency or another outreach worker that can provide that support. Uh, in a much better way. And then so I spend all this time doing all this research, looking for housing for someone, and I'm not the expert in it, uh, but I'm spending countless amount of hours doing that, uh, while if I just referred someone in a meaningful way to another place that uh, can do that support, 
then it would be way, way, way more efficient. Uh, but we're just, I, I, and you know, some people are doing that, but I think that we need to do that a lot, a lot better and a lot more. And, and thank you, Austin. Um, and like I had mentioned before with, with um, Hannah and Shafia, it's, it's important to have this space. And because I feel like this, this is the first step. This is the first step to, to moving towards that is a little phrase I always like to remember is, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And so it's finally when we're, we're challenged with that, that notion that we haven't acknowledged and for that being able to stand up here and say, you know, these are the things that even, even myself, I haven't done, but it's something just by acknowledging it, that's, that's the first step. And that's hopefully something that, you know, we, we do work towards, but no, um, from my end, everything that, that you are doing, everything that each grassroots organization, they ha it's a tough job. It's hard to be perfect. It's hard to get it all done um, because of the nature of the job and because there's so many different moving parts to it. Um, and so knowing that, you know, we are trying, we are trying our best. <laughs> um, and for, for the audience members that maybe, you know, aren't part of the grassroots organizations, maybe, you know, are part of the corporate world or maybe are still a student or in the health field, what are, what what would you like them to know? What would you like them to take away of, you know, something that maybe they could do, they could start either tomorrow, next week, or in the future. Keep it keep in mind. What is what is something that you would suggest or advise? Yeah, I mean, like, given I I don't know the whole audience and what everyone's role is, but I I, I think that um, what everyone can really start doing is. Um, kind of recognizing their privilege and their positionality wherever they are. So whether they are a student, whether they are a funder, whether they are a CEO or whether they are, you know, um, a mother or, you know, a volunteer, um, whatever it is recognizing and also recognizing all the different um, identity privileges as well. Like whether you are white, whether you are Asian, whether you are black, uh, whether you are queer or trans or whatever. Or, or straight, um, you know, I, I think we need to start thinking about our positionality and what privileges that brings um, to whatever role we have in society. And also rethinking, you know, what a role in society means and not just defining ourselves from, you know, our job, but defining ourselves in, you know, a more holistic perspective. Um, and, then, and then, you know, self-reflecting on how can I make, how can I use my privilege and my positionality uh, for the better? Um, and that, that, that is a question that everyone needs to kind of ask, ask themselves and, and reflect on. And uh, I won't be able to tell you what that, what that is, um, but I think everyone does have a role in, in, in helping out. Um, and, and, you know, whether that's the downtown east side or there's so many injustices in this world. Um, and so, you know, just thinking outside of the downtown east side, thinking about, you know, how you can contribute to, uh, you know, what, what you're compassionate about too. Um, I think it doesn't do any service if you're not passionate about something and you just feel obligated to give back in whatever way. Um, really thinking about what makes you thrive as a community member in your community uh, and really like honing in on that and, and using your strengths um, to make, you know, to, to make the best change that you can. Done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, sorry, I'm just also taking that on. As Christina would say, she'd be like, nuggets. <laughs> you, you'll learn later why, why I do that. <laughs> but thank you, Austin. Um, you know, you really tapped in some important things. The importance of reflection. Reflection can do so much for us. Um, they really, it really not only challenges, you know, the way that we, that we think, but, you know, it, it's time for reflection and time to really ground ourselves and to really take in all that's all that's going on around us and kind of see where we fit in all of it and so thank you so much austin for being a part of this this talk today um for anyone that wants to learn more please visit um uh, uh, eastside works website and, and learn more about what embers and austin and the great community uh, at eastside works does all right Thanks, thank you <laughs> up next after the break, 
we have Mark and Elwood, who are the founders of Crap Trapper, who are downtown Eastside peers, as well as Employee Empower Entrepreneurs, who we actually had the privilege of meeting through Austin. Woo-woo. <laughs> Talk about communities connected. <laughs> All right. Mark DeFridas and Elwood Price, also known as Crap Trapper, are active members and contributors to the downtown Eastside community. They started Crap Trapper with Employee to Empower right before the pandemic, a small business venture removing human waste in the downtown east side. Mark and Elwood hope to grow Crap Trapper towards employing others who also face work and social barriers, as well as increase tourism in Chinatown through their services. Mark and Elwood will bring the realities of living in the downtown east side, the strength, the resilience, and sense of community that they have always felt in this interview. So, of course, our, sorry, you threw me off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, we have, <laughs> we're on air now, we're on air. <laughs> and last but not least, definitely not least, we have two, two people that I'm, I'm honored to call friends of mine. They are, yes, <laughs> they are inspiring individuals, dedicated individuals who care so much about their community. Um, before I introduce them, even though they're already here, <laughs> I'd love to, to share with you a quick video. That it was um, Roosevelt's uh, wife. Um, she said, uh, the way to be prosperous is to make yourself useful. So look for something that needs to be done that isn't being done and try and make a way of being able to do it. Um, at the same time, helping out people because uh, helping out people makes the community stronger, yourself stronger, and it's a win-win all the way around. My, one of my biggest hope is to be able to get bigger, grow, and hire some of these people down here. Yeah. I want to uh, give somebody an opportunity, like down here. Yeah. The people down here, like let them you do it. You actually have to live in it. Yeah. Let them do yeah. it. Let them make some money doing yeah. it. Why not? Yeah. A warm welcome to Mark and Elwood. Woo! Thank you to our live audience of three. <laughs> really pumping us up today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, of course, by the way, if any, this one is Mark. This is Elwood. Just so everyone knows. Just so everyone knows. Just so everyone knows. Um, all right. So, <laughs> to start off with today, uh, actually, let's start with let's start with Mark because Mark, you lived around the world. He's lived in many, many places. Um, and I've learned this recently from our conversations. Um, and you talk about downtown east side being your favorite. Um, can you kind of describe to us, you know, what makes the downtown east side community so unique? The people, definitely the people. They're like, I, you just said I've lived all over the outlet. I've come to find that everybody down here is more real in like, it seems abrupt and rude sometimes, but that's the way they are. You know what they are and how they feel. And like, it's a community and we all help each other out. Yeah. And you don't get that much anywhere else I find, like with people helping each other. Like, I know people, I see people every day and we always talk, right? Walking down the road, you talk to anybody. Like, I used to live in Richmond. Like, I didn't know my neighbors five doors down or anything like that. We never used to talk or like that. You pass them by and, hmm. But actually people down here stopping, hey, what's up and all that, right? They care about each other. I love it here. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, you know, why is there that difference that exists? There's a, there's a stigma down here and we all know it. And who, who, who's gonna help us but each other? Exactly. Yeah, we help each other. Who else is going to help us? Like, we're going to come down and try, but we know what we want. We know how to help each other. Mm -hmm. Right? You understand what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel yeah. it. Um, all right. I want, to, I want to bring it to Elwood. Okay. Yeah. We'll go. I think it's because we have to communicate to each other because we need to be able to do things that we have to do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do things that we have to do. So we're forced to communicate to each other. But it's a good thing because communication is a very important part of creating a strong community. 100%. Um, and 
when thinking about, you know, when I, when I think about the two of you, I think about not only your very vibrant personalities, but, you know, the hard work that you put into the community um, because you feel so connected. What is, you know, what inspired what you do? I know that wasn't on the list of questions that I sent, but I, wa I want to dive into what inspired. <laughs> he inspires me. He inspires me. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, um, yeah, it, 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 well, I think that what does is the uh, need to grow. Um, uh, things happen so fast here before all the other places because um, you're in the first front line when things are changing and things are having to change. And so you have to diversify quicker. And the only way that you can do that is if you have other people for support and understanding, because um, uh, I, when I have to do things differently, sometimes I'm not doing it exactly the right way. And uh, I have a friend like Mark who will say, hey, you know, you're almost doing it okay, but it should be like this, right? And I'll go, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, um, but um, I think I think that uh, um, yeah, it's 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 like um, because there is more communication between people, um, it's a bigger sense of community. But you're able to um, develop faster and be ready for the new things that are coming up, and 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 you have to diversify because you take just with the coronavirus. There's so many things that have changed that um, um, you have to know in advance, but there's no way you can do it by yourself, right? So the only way you can do it by talking to other people and taking their in, intake. And um, with that, if, they, if those people weren't there, we would be kind of lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I said, like, people, people, we need people that, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, but people like Christine from ET, like, when I started this business, I first before I came in, I met. I thought I knew everything on the control, right? When I first started, but then Austin, who I work for, for East Side Works, not Embers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, not Embers. Yeah, East Side Works. Yeah, um, we did this. We did Chinatown. I was part of the Chinatown program, right? And through them, what story was? When we walk through Chinatown, there's poop all over the place. Poop, right? Everywhere, everywhere you look. And it's on the supervisor and all that thing. I, I already mentioned this before. But my part was when I called and found out nobody's picking up the poop, I just okay, kind of form a company and get this done. And I was going to just go out like blind. But then um, Austin told me about this nice lady called Christina Wong from <laughs> Employed in Power. I mean, I should hook up with her. And yeah, I did in November of the last two years ago now. Wow, it's been a long time. But um, yeah. And if it wasn't for her teaching me the stuff that I need to know, I'd be a lot further back than I am right now, right? And you need organizations like that to help encourage and help you out, regardless of who or what you are or whatever your circumstances are or your issues, right? You have to look beyond that and see the person themselves. And like, I, I love this person for that because, hey, yeah. And you too, girl. <laughs> yeah. Love you, you too. Know, there, I love you too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make you cry on my camera. But yeah, but that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You bring out what we need brought out. What's in there that needs to be brought out, right? And that, yeah, we're going to screw up. Yeah, we're going to make mistakes. But you still know that. <laughs> you still accept this. Accept this thing, right? Because you're human. And yeah. Because you're we're, human. You know, honey, when we scroll, we scroll big. <laughs> yeah. But, and, yeah. And yeah. when there's pitfalls, like, oh my yeah. God, like, they, they, uh, like, we were doing the pilot project last year and everything, and then, um, you know, on, on the, the city council gives $75,000 grant to Mission Possible because they said that there wasn't anybody who was already doing it. And because we were too small, I guess they forgot about us or didn't you know, recognize us. And uh, um, uh, 
like I mean, my heart dropped because uh, we had already done like almost a year's worth of work, and and uh, like I invested over twenty thousand dollars and uh, and everything, and like everything that we're doing is new. It's like because there isn't anything or anybody that's doing this, so it all is like like scientific groundbreaking oh. things. Yeah, and and pearls to take care of and everything, and so we're setting the groundwork um, because nobody has done it. And uh, so it's like um, when, uh, when, when we found out that the, the city had accidentally done this, so that um, it's like, oh no. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, because of the job of Christina, um, um, uh, she got in contact with Mission Possible so that we could do negotiations. And now we're working with them to do this uh, contract, uh, which basically um, makes it so that we're still growing. If not, we would have been no longer Right, um, and uh, so so things like that, people like that, um, uh, are very necessary um, to help because I had no idea how to confront them, um, um, and uh, um, how to um, have it uh, come out of a positive uh, outcome, um, and uh, now it's like a, like um, I got some more information because there's um, there's bylaws because the insurance had to be bought outside of Canada because there isn't any insurance companies that cover for the liability insurance. And uh, uh, so um, uh, now there's a certain things that are bylaws, which I found out just yesterday that um, have to be done so that that way we're not infringing on anything that is you know, needed. And um, even Mission Possible doesn't even know these things yet. And I haven't even had a chance to talk to them about this. <laughs> and, Exclusive so, here now. Um, um, <laughs> Um, and, and you know what? It, it's also like Eastside works, like because because we leave our scooters there, we have to use scooters. And so anyway, um, um, it's all those different people and everything that have been helping us, and hopefully it will grow and things will be good. <laughs> and, Hi there. Hello. Hi there. <laughs> hello. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of our goals here today, um, as you've probably heard me say many times while sitting over there, is to offer the platform for individuals to speak for themselves. Another opportunity that we're trying to have available is for all these stories to be heard from um, the downtown Eastside community. So right now we are trying to record all these messages um, and you know, have them available to organizations such as Eastside Works, Mission Possible, Downtown Eastside Women's Center, and UGM to display um, in their organizations. And so to those individuals that may be watching this, what is your advice to a peer entrepreneur? Curveball. <laughs> Curveball. <laughs> if you're wondering, it's right there. <laughs> See, uh, what's my advice to other peer entrepreneurs? Of other peer entrepreneurs in the downtown east side. Persistence, Persistence dedication, don't give up. And... So you, there's organizations, like you said, ET. You have to, you, okay. Yeah, yeah. But there's, here we go. There's, yeah. Well, Sorry, Mark. Yeah, that's go all good. But like I was saying, you got to find those people, like, like I said, I was in the dark. Um, Austin, oh, thank God he showed me that. But they, you have to find like organizations that can help specific people. Like a big organization cannot help everybody. Like uh, Austin's saying, we're all separated, right? And one person do one thing. Yeah, but why would you have that one person do that one thing? Like, you know what I mean? And like, have us all like, show us. It's out there. Like, like have. People are just out more on the spotlight. I didn't know about her. She didn't know about me. But there's a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of good people down here. There's a lot of talent, raw talent that needs to be brought out. And in doing so, if you bring it out a person, obviously they'll lift up. Like, like I said, I've had my issues. And because I'm so busy, I can't dedicate my time to my issues. <laughs> right? I'm just busy, busy, busy. And it's helping me not want to do anything. But like get ahead. Funded coordinators, funded coordinators that basically um, uh, can have the time and, and, and ability 
to uh, find all the different avenues and spaces and support that is available to direct these people in the ways and avenues that will give them the support in order to make their situations into reality. Um, because of the lack of ability for them to know where to look and who to talk to, um, they do not have that um, avenues and, and funding that would be available to them. And so they spend all of their energy trying to do that and they get frustrated. So they just say, well, I have this, right? Um, and, um, and then a lot of times too, is I've seen that they've got to the point where they're just on the fruition of being and then something happens, like, you know, and then, then they, they, they gum up, they do something wrong and it just goes, <laughs> And right, and so, so right. yes, yeah, so, 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 yes, so that is having like you know, with, with, with you know, coming to empower right, with Christina, right? It's good, like, because once a week, you know, when we get together, because there's also every week, there's all sorts of different things that we have to take care of, and it's like, well, what do we do about this now? And you know, if we don't do this, we can't go forward, right? And you know, and then oh, like, uh, oh, well, we'll check it out. We'll do this and that and everything. And like, I mean, there must have been at least a hundred different things that we had to do differently than you would normally do in order to make things keep going. Um, and um, I can see how it would be really frustrating for people uh, trying to do it on their own and not knowing what to do. And every time, you know, that would be terrible. It would be like a roller coaster ride for sure. Okay, so I'm gonna get back to Mark. <laughs> okay, I got this. I'm yeah, just here. Also, I'm not, I don't need to be here. I know he doesn't need to be here. I got, I got this. Also, wait. It's like you were saying, we're, every day is new. So it's just a roadblock, roadblock, roadblock. Like it, it's just we're going through a lot of paperwork, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of BS, just to get to where we want to do. All we want to do is pick up crap off the ground. So it cleans up the city that nobody else wants to do. Ooh. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I know, I know. Uh, yeah, I'm getting coached here by my mentor. Okay, anyways, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, why, why so, so, why so, so many roadblocks in front of a person? Why don't you try to help them out? Like you'd be surprised what we're going through just hell just to like do something, make something of our lives. But it, yeah, like we're we're small. We're like we're people, but we're not anybody. You know what I mean? I mean, we're somebody. You something you to yeah. You're important. I know, but you're we're important. somebody, but we're not anybody. It's just, it's just, <laughs> not I don't know how to get this part of the class. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Just encouragement, belief. And you gotta give a shit. Yeah, you gotta give a shit. <laughs> or take a shit. shit. Depends. <laughs> or, or take it. We take it. You give it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You will keep them in business if you give That's them. right. You give a shit. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. And they, you gotta accept people for who they are. Whatever, whatever, whatever they are, all of them. Just want to accept the good part, accept the bad part of them too, accept them fully, right? Totally. If you accept them totally, then you know, okay, this person like this, okay, he is who he is, she is who she is. Right? Doing what they have to do to get, yeah. yeah, to get it done. Heck yeah! Oh. <laughs> hey, I got the mic. I got the mic. <laughs> we are actually out of time. Yes. Oh, out of time. Oh, oh, I'm I want to say one last thing. I want to sell that thing. Okay, so we're going to be making, we're going to be making buttons. They're a little bit bigger than this, right? So if, uh, to help support, because we're buying new equipment that is like, we have new scientific research by doing it. And it's costly. So if you'd like to help support what we're doing, we have buttons. We have buttons that, that you can order, okay? If you'd like to help out, that would be great because I'm running out of cash. <laughs> well, like, I've invested everything I made so far, and plus another twenty thousand dollars. And like, and it's like, yeah, but but I know a better way that would be faster and easier and less uh, less less harmful. But that's the only way you can do it, right? We have to do the scientific research. So um, so thank you very much. Um, oh, and everyone, keep keep cracking, keep cracking. <laughs> Don't leave yeah, here. We, we have a Q&A. Q &A. Q &A. <laughs> no, okay, okay. Keep trucking. Come on, you can do it. Keep trucking. You can do it. Keep talking about every day. I know you can do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark and Alan. Right. <laughs> Hope everyone at home is having just as much fun as I am. I always have so much fun with these two. <laughs> If you want to learn more, actually check out their 
mini documentary that was filmed by two amazing volunteers, Sam and Ari. You can oh, find it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, they're good people. They're good people. Hey, we're good people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, voluntarily. <laughs> voluntarily. Voluntarily. <laughs> uh, but yes, if you would like to check out their mini documentary as well as the other entrepreneurs within our program, please visit carboproject.com as well where you can visit the virtual gallery that houses all of these amazing carbo pieces and more because there's only about like like 15 there but there's probably 100 on this uh, website Ooh -hoo. Ooh -hoo. up next we have the q and a but before that we'll have a break the q and a will host all three no nope, two four five <laughs> sorry quick math quick math <laughs> All five of the speakers. We've collected all of your questions that you've sent throughout the, the session, and we'll hopefully try to reach all of them. All right. Hey, bye, everybody. Hey, all right, day. we'll see you soon. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's me again. We are trying to fix the survey link for Mark and Elwood, so sorry about that. We Once we figure it out, we will either put it in the chat or if we don't get it done for the end of this session, we can always email it out to you guys as well. And we'd really appreciate it if you could fill it out and help out Mark and Elwood with their next project. In the meantime, we're gonna take a short break. Like Carissa said, this is gonna be our last break before our final Q&A of the day and then we'll wrap up. So we are going to come back in five minutes at 6.45. If you need to use the bathroom, grab some water, stretch, do whatever you need to do, uh, go for it and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Okay. All right. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, well, I was just getting question. some more information. So um, unfortunately, Hannah will not be joining the Q&A, but we have some great questions here for Austin, Mark and Elwood. So first <laughs> off for Austin, we have a question from Emily. We have, she says, on the topic of partnerships to reduce duplication of effort, does Vancouver Public Library play a role, either system-wide or on a program's level? I am curious if there is an existing relationship there or if they actively provide support for job seekers, health information, housing, uh, and housing information, et cetera. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know too, too much about uh, all the different programs that the library offers. I do know that the, the Carnegie Center, which is technically a, a community center and library um, in the downtown east side, they do a, a lot of, of really great work, actually. Um, and as far as duplicating services, I think what they do, they do have a, um, like a monthly newsletter that goes out into the community around all the different resources that are available and any news in the downtown east side. And so... I think things like that is are really good um, ways that the, the library has been helping out. Um, and then, yeah, but I, and, you know, on a systems level, I've, you know, the, when I think about libraries, I think about you know, knowledge dissemination. Uh, and so anything that the libraries can do around making sure people know about what resources are available. Um, I also know that libraries are kind of in a, an identity crisis mode right now around um, you know, we're, we're less relying on books and more on like internet and computers. And I think that also frees up space for libraries to potentially start running more types of uh, programming. I know that they do have some, a lot of community programming that is available um, around training and you know, building capacity for, um, for different interests. And so I think more of that, I think would be a great use of, of library space programming. Uh, another thing is, uh, www.bchousing.org. Yeah, actually, um, I would. You, you made me think about there. There was actually a post that I saw online. I, I don't know exactly where this was, but um, what I found really interesting is there. There was a library that had a list of all of the uh, Dewey Decimal numbers or um, where you can find information around topics that are often stigmatized. Um, so that way you don't necessarily have to talk to someone and ask someone if you're looking for mental health supports, if you're looking for, um, you know, any, anything that might be stigmatizing or that you might be, you know, embarrassed or shameful to, to talk about. Um, and so they just had, you know, a list of those topics and exactly where you can find books around that topic. Um, and just making those, those types of resources just more accessible, whether that is through programming or through, um, you know, the library's. Um, or, um, yeah, so 
so I, I thought that was a neat idea um, that we can that we can try maybe. Great, thank you so much, Austin. All right, this one is for Mark and Elwood. So this one comes from Amanda. She asks, um, sorry, Amanda. Yes, Amanda. This Amanda. <laughs> uh, she asks, tell us more about your goals for Crap Trapper. Why is Crap Trapper so important to you? Okay, can I go first? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, it is an essential thing. Um, the uh, reason why there is nobody that knows and the specifications on how to do it is because nobody's done it. Uh, the last time that a city gave a fine for someone not picking up the dog poop was 1984. Okay, and um, so basically, um, because nobody's done it, um, and it's becoming a necessity because there's more people, right? More people, more dogs, more things. Uh, so it's like, because it's now a necessary thing, a health reason, it has to be tackled now. Otherwise, it's gonna be worse. And so we're tackling it as best we can now because the need is there and hopefully it'll go good. <laughs> Uh, the future for what I'm trying to do here. What, what my goal is um, to eventually grow, get bigger, and start hiring our residents down here and give them work. Like it's something they can do. It's only like three, three hours, four hours a day, rather than eight hour time, and to empower them, to give them something like give them a little bit of self respect, right? To, yeah, make them, yeah, and then, yeah, they're helping out their community. If you're helping out your community, making your community like we got, like I said, we got a bad rap down here. And if we get, people can see we're helping ourselves and actually doing like what, doing that, it's not the greatest job in the world. Hell, we're gonna get a little bit of respect. Next, <laughs> and yeah, I just want to grow. I want to grow and get big. I don't want to. I don't want to hire people from students and all that. I want to hire people from downtown East End. That's who I want. My peeps. <laughs> That's it. Peeps helping peeps. My peeps. Yeah, peeps can I help my peeps? peeps. Government will pay for half of the employment if we do it right. So that means that it will make more jobs, right? And then, you know, it's gonna last. It's not gonna be something. You don't need a special kid skill. Yeah, you don't gotta go to school to learn this. Actually, you kind of do, but we do have to train them. Yeah, yeah, them. Yeah. But but <laughs> it's it's a job anybody can do. Anybody can do it. You don't gotta go years, ten thousand dollars help. I'll teach you for 10 bucks, I'll do your job. <laughs> well, well the, thing, the thing is, you know, common sense, there is the safety bylaws that we have to teach them. And, you know, um, and so that, that way they're not putting themselves at risk. We're not going to hire people and not have them, you know, yeah, safe. Yeah. Right? You know, um, and uh, but it's mostly common sense, right? And that's it. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait to, can't wait to see yeah. this. I can't wait to see the growth. And, you, you know, you said, Really powerful things, and kind of what you know, Austin has also said too is um, what Christina has. Um, she drew me this image of you know the impact of a uh, of a ripple effect, and that what you two are contributing to is that ripple effect of change, because it starts with that one person. But once you start to you know empower others around you, you will <laughs> grow and see amazing things come out of it. Yeah. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Okay. With poop, there's I'm growth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring it back to Austin, then I'll bring it back to you. <laughs> Sorry, Austin. Uh, we have this question from Brenda. Uh, she asks, um, how does affordable childcare impact employment services? Tricky. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, I, I, I think that I, I saw that question really resonated with me. I'm actually working with a couple of clients right now who are single parents. Um, and I've been, it's been really a, a pretty big struggle for when they, you know, their, their hours are only so flexible because they have to be there for, for their kids and they can't afford um, daycare or childcare. And, and they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And you know, there's, there's nothing really we can do as an employment hub because then we're not going to have this people leave their kids alone. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think affordable childcare is is a necessity um, especially in you know as as we're moving in society where we don't have these traditional gender norms where you know one person stays at home and one person goes to work um, no matter what those genders are like I, I think that we all have that desire some people do want to stay at home and that's totally fine but I think a lot of a lot of us are you know career oriented or want to work 
um, or want to give back to the community in various ways. And um, I think childcare is, is so unaffordable and not just unaffordable, but so hard to access too. I know, um, you know, even friends and colleagues that, you know, have the money to pay for childcare, but there's so much of waiting list in order to even just get into uh, affordable daycare or even just any sort of daycare. Um, so I, I think we definitely need to move the dial on that. And that's a huge gap uh, in, in services right now. Thanks for asking that question. That's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> All right. We got another question for you. Um, have you come up against any resistance out in the community while working as the crop tracker? That's a good one. Actually, um, from people in this area, not at all. Actually, people down here are thanking us, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, in in what area? Which area? Where are we? Uh, downtown Hastings Crossing, South Carolina, BIA, Chinatown BIA, everybody else supported, blah, blah, blah. And they like, just the acknowledgement, like, hey, thanks. It's like, it's, it helps, it helps, it helps. It helps me continue on. But, oh, hang on, I got this. <laughs> but in the Granville area and the uh, Hoity Toity Gaston area, people, you, you're doing the same job, but it's just tunnel vision. Or they say, excuse me a minute. Or they say, excuse me, out of my way. Well, buddy, I'm here picking up shit for you so you don't step in it next time, right? So like, why should I move anyway? Come on, you can go around me. It's no big deal. That's that's kind of resistant, but it's only because they don't do it again. Because it's like uh, uh, it's like something that they don't even want to actually think about uh, who's going to take care of it. And then when they see us doing it, they think, well, they're not doing that. It's supposed to be the city. We should have a big truck to, <laughs> right? And have all the equipment and everything. And uh, meanwhile, we're just on scooters and walking. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a stigmatism, right? So so like they're almost like you're looking, well, like uh, like I, I had a security guy come out and um, say, "What are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm picking up the poop." And he goes, "Well, who told you to do that?" <laughs> And, and, I, and I said, well, like, well, that's what we're doing. We're, we're working for, you know, a contract with the city. Um, and he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, things like that, right? Um, how, about the, how about the one day at the, the mall? Okay, we were outside of the uh, Crafts from Waterfront Station, and we had to sort out all the call-outs. And the security guy comes out, and it's really windy, and he says, excuse me, you can't, you, you can't stay here. It's private property. And we're, we're, but we're just sorting out all the colors and your place is one of the places so that we have to do. <laughs> and so, 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 yeah. so, so we, yeah, right? And, and so, uh, so, you know, um, yeah. And, um, but the police, the police are really cooperative. The police really, you know, they, they, they thank us a lot, you know, right? They say, oh, it's, I, we're glad somebody's finally doing it because, right? And uh, so, yeah, and it, that, that seems to be about it. But I think the other areas will get better once you know they know who we are and everything. After this, they're gonna know who we are. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> Everybody, Mark and I were crap trapper. Yeah. <laughs> crap trapper. <laughs> All right. It looks like we have Hannah and Shafia here with us. Hello, hello. We have. We also have some questions for you if you Yay. two Please. are ready. The first. Yes. One being, the first one being from Sean. It says, um, do you have oh, do you have to ensure there is no air or bubbles in the needle when you draw back the Narcan? Um, champagne bubbles are okay. Um, yes, but um, yeah, if the bubble's quite large, then you can always like either do this or like use a pen and then draw like go back and then pull it back and then it usually get get rid of the bubbles. Yeah. Yeah, and every time I've done it, and I've done it multiple times, um, yeah, you never yeah. really worry about that. It's an emergency situation. You just go for it, and you're good to go. There you go. Amazing. Um, sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot going on. Everyone's being hyped. Um, so, in terms of the interest for time, we have two more questions that we'll we'll give to Hannah uh, Shafia. So the next question is from Sheila. 
Can you give a shot of Narcan through clothing? Absolutely. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know that too. I'm glad someone asked. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> um, yeah, and the and needle's then, pretty thick and long. So you are okay. Just like EpiPen, you can go through the clothes. It's like pretty much the same. But not leather. <laughs> but not leather. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and last question from. <laughs> okay, last question that we have from Emily. Um, she says, thank you for your Narcan demonstration. That was really powerful. When working with indigenous communities, are there certain steps beyond the steps you mentioned when they regain consciousness that you have to take to perform culturally sensitive care? Oh, good one. Um, so with the indigenous communities, we know that they've gone through a lot of trauma. So naturally, I, when I care for people at the RAC, the RAC Act Physician Clinic, and they come from indigenous background, I always, I, I'm always a little bit more patient um, because some of them do come, you know, angry because healthcare hasn't been all, the best to them at all times. So I give them the patience. I, I let them speak and I love to listen. Um, I like to create trust with them because then I know that they're more likely to come back and I can actually start um, making a difference in their lives and get them to kind of trust the healthcare system once again. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. People, people who are people. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. This has been uh, an absolute pleasure having all of you having Mark and Elwood, Austin, Hannah, and Shafia to be Thank a part you. of this you know, important day to come together and you know, as you know, bringing it back to our intent of the day, you know, coming in with an open mind, coming in and really listening to each and one of each of your individual experiences. Because again, it's this is a unique opportunity, a unique opportunity for everybody in the audience to learn something new that they probably wouldn't have learned otherwise. I know I learned a lot. <laughs> um, and so from the bottom of my heart, from everyone here at the studio, three people, <laughs> and uh, everybody that, and five people, <laughs> every, <see> math, <laughs> everybody that is in the Zoom call, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very we much. can't wait for cardboard project number four either. <laughs> yes, and meet everybody in person. Off. We have a bunch of questions for the audience as well as some, uh, lots of thank you. Cardboard project three would not be possible without our sponsors. SFU External Relations, Office of the Vice President, BC Housing, Daily Hive, Spotlight West, Fan City, and Salema. Our virtual gallery was made possible by photographers Ollie Dickerson and Anna Ashbury, web designer Jordan Simmons, videographer Sam Newfeld, and audio specialist Ari Kikuchi.